let's dive into the world of plants. And so uh, one of the things that you should definitely watch, check if your library has it, there's tons of clips on YouTube, is uh, David Attenborough BBC documentary called The Private Life of Plants. And it's going to completely change your opinion of plants. I watched that in my life totally changed. I took some plant physiology courses in college and I can tell you uh, the person who's explaining this stuff makes a big difference to your enthusiasm uh, for plants in general. But watch that that documentary, David Attenborough, BBC, The Private Life of Plants, or is it called The Secret Life of Plants? I think it's called The Private Life of Plants and uh, it's going to rock your world. All right, so we're going to dive into some of the nitty gritty details of plant structure and growth and I'll try to explain a few things. Uh, to make it a little bit more easy to remember and make it more meaningful and see the big significance of all this stuff. So diving right in, when you look at a leaf, basically, what's really neat about a leaf is that every kid can draw a picture of a leaf. You know, it's kind of the general idea of a leaf. It's kind of pointed at the end. There's like these little branched veins and stuff like that. It's kind of curved at the top. All of that, all of the design, all of the design of a leaf is really... Uh, fascinating to actually study because every single aspect of it is well adapted for its particular uh, function, what it's supposed to do. You know the importance of leaves and plants. You've heard of photosynthesis. You've heard of using light energy to make uh, glucose and to turn that into starch. Then we eat plants to get all kinds of energy. So we understand that plants are important. You just never get to see them really living on the same time scale that, that humans are. But um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, one thing I've just I've just tended to think about over the over the years is that water is very important, and so when we're looking at xylem versus phloem, okay, xylem as a structure that carries water, think about water being really important. So if you have to label or draw a diagram of an actual cross section of a leaf, so this is like uh, the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf, and it's as if we cut through the side, and then we can actually see these layers magnified up really closely. Um, one thing you're going to have to remember is the relative positions of the xylem vessels versus the uh, phloem vessels. And I just think that water is very important. So I always remember that water is on top or it's in the center, top or in the center. So in this case, when you have these two vessels that are next to each other, xylem is going to be on top. When you're looking at these diagrams, remember these diagrams are not showing, this kind of diagram is not showing all the individual cells. So it's kind of like a low power uh, magnification. You don't have to draw on the details. The important thing is to see the distinction between the layers and the relative positions next to each other. For example, this top layer here is where most of the sunlight is probably going to reach and it probably is not going to, uh, or a lot of the light is going to be blocked off by the time it reaches the bottom layer. So I can assume that the top layer here is important for photosynthesis. In other words, all the chlorophyll and the chloroplasts Will, uh, will actually be located in this top layer, which happens to be called the palisade mesophyll layer. You can come up with creative ways to remember that, um, but that's one thing to work on. Down here uh, is still part of the leaf, but it's called the spongy mesophyll, and you don't actually see the cells, but if you could see the cells, you could imagine that the cells are kind of spread out a little bit. In other words, there's a lot of space, air spaces, hence the name spongy mesophyll, basically. Uh, the top layer here, um, why is that important? Well, if you ever look at the surface of a leaf, it's very smooth. There is actually a waxy layer, and that's actually going to prevent some water loss because one problem for plants is there's so much surface area on these leaves that all the water that, water that it takes in through the roots can uh, be lost really easily, and we don't want that to happen. We already have a problem of water uh, can evaporate out through these holes right here, the stoma, but we need the holes because these holes are actually pores that are going to allow uh, gases to go in and out. We know that photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide needs to go in and then oxygen is going to come out through here as well too. But these holes can actually close. These holes are called uh, stoma. They're called stomata actually. And the guard cells around the side, depending on the water that's present, um, in, the, in these cells or the presence of another additional hormone can actually cause these guard cells to open and close. You can imagine if they close, that'll help prevent some water loss, but they need to open sometimes in order to allow gas to actually move in and out. So xylem brings the water, phloem transports the products of photosynthesis. So we're really talking about um, photosynthesis converting carbon dioxide into glucose. And so glucose gets made here and then it's going to get transported through these uh, these tubes, the veins in the leaf, 
the particularly the phloem, and then those products, the sugar, are going to be stored as starch, maybe delivered to other parts of the plant for growing and uh, energy requirements and various things like that. Okay, anything else we need to mention here? So a lot about structure related to the function. I didn't read everything that's on the slide, but I think you can get the gist of it. So pause and uh, see what you need in order to go through uh, and understand some of this stuff. Here are a few questions you can use to look at. You're going to have to pause the video and go back and then take a peek at that. All right, that's totally unnecessary. But I'm just pointing out a few of the things you need to take a look at. Here's a quick practice question, an actual past IV question. What part of the human body is most similar in function to the spongy mesophyll layer in a leaf? If you just watched the previous uh, slide, then you'll probably be okay. Try to figure it out. It's kind of a weird question. But uh, uh, anyways, pause the video because I'm going to give you the answer right now. Okay. Probably do with the, the sponginess, the, the spaces for air, pretty much something like that. Large surface area in order for uh, gas to diffuse and everything like that. Okay, we're going to come back and look at that a little bit later. Uh, some more of these plan diagrams, low power diagrams. So we just saw a, a, a leaf. Now we're looking at a stem. So start with, the, start with the leaf, then what holds them up, it's going to be the stems. So if you take a look here, I can probably guess that these, the white and the gray, again, they're not showing individual cells. So in here would be individual cells, and here would be a bunch of individual cells. But remember, remember what I said earlier, is that water is really important. So I can guess that the ones in the center here are probably carrying water. So they are, in fact, going to be xylem. On the outside will be the phloem. And then you have various other structural layers here. Now, stems can be very thin or they can end up being very, very thick. So these cells uh, can actually, there's kind of like a stem, a layer of stem cells that can continue to divide and grow more cells. And those, so this thing can, this stem can actually grow wider and wider and wider, uh, turning into very large things, including uh, trees that actually will produce some kind of lignin and it's going to fortify this actual stem. So we keep seeing this thing called dicots and in the previous diagram you also saw that's that was actually a dicot leaf. Dicot is short for dicotyledon basically and it's uh, you're going to see this when we talk about the seeds. And in the very beginning, when you see a seed, if you open up a seed, it either has one of these cotyledons or two cotyledons. If it has two of them, then it's a dicot. When you ask a kid to draw a typical picture of a plant, uh, they're probably going to end up drawing a dicot. It's what you have pictured as a typical type of uh, flower. There are some exceptions, though. And uh, the typical leaf that someone would draw, those are all dicot leaves. And we're going to compare the difference between dicots and monocots later, but not in too much detail. So just for your reference here, the outermost layer is called the epidermis. It happens to be what the outermost layer of our body is actually called as well, too. This middle area is called the cortex. I already mentioned that the phloem. And then in the center here, we have the xylem. And the xylem is special because not only does it carry the water, but uh, it adds to the thickness of wood uh, of various stems. Cambium is a small layer in here, and it contains something called meristematic tissue or lateral meristem. We're going to see another type of meristem called apical meristem, but lateral means to the side. So this lateral meristem, as it thickens, as it divides and produces more cells, you can imagine that the stem is actually going to end up growing really, really wide as a result of this entire thing. In the center, you have some more structural, structural cells uh, referred to as the pith. And for comparison, this is what a monocot plant stem actually looks like. So it's not as organized as a dicot. And just a little side note, if you need to recall some monocot plants, basically, uh, if you remember the word oil, orchids, irises, and lilies are examples of monocot flowers. Most of the other flowers that you would point out are actually dicots. And then you can see the difference in the types of leaves and the stem structure and also the root structure as well. Okay, some more comparison pictures. These are not diagrams, these are actual pictures. Notice these these microscope images actually show the individual cells, but you're never going to be required to draw that. This is the image that we just saw uh, earlier down in the bottom right, right here. Okay, And then this is a, a dicot stem, so an actual picture shows you that uh, they're not just making this stuff up okay so this area can actually increase in size so this is the these are the xylem tubes over here and this is going to be phloem the outside <coughs> roots are coming up next and so roots 
uh, versus a dicot root versus a monocot root. Now this image can be a little bit confusing when you're looking at these images to be able to recognize the difference between the stem of a dicot and the root of a monocot. But uh, take a look at the various structures. If you know exactly what you're looking for, then it's going to be easier to distinguish between them. So stems and the roots. So let's go ahead and look at uh, root diagram next. So in dicots, here we have the root. Again, phloem is closer to the outside, xylem closer to the inside. So in the roots, in the roots of a plant, this is all buried. Well, for most plants, it's all underground. These roots are all spread out to absorb uh, water, lots of surface area to bring in water and to bring in essential, essential nutrients and everything that you need. Again, we have center layer called the pith procambium, um, the pericycle. The pericycle is just a layer of tissues that's in between the endodermis and the phloem. It can also uh, widen as well too. Endodermis, the inner surrounding layer here. Parenchyma cells are also structural cells. And then the outermost layer is called the epidermis as well too. We're going to get into the actual function of this in more detail in a later video when we talk about um, absorption and uptake of mineral ions and water and everything like that. But here's a monocot root for comparison. So relatively simple. You can just sketch out these diagrams. Just do this a few times. Uh, remember, you're looking at the leaf and the stem and the root. And you're just only required to draw these diagrams for dicot plants. All right. So uh, this little bundle in the middle, in the middle, we call a vascular cylinder. And then cortex is referring to these outer layers here. You're going to see these words. Uh, they're used in all kinds of anatomical studies uh, in, the, in the kidney there's a cortex area as well too it just refers in general to a layer on the outside surrounding another layer on the inside so you're going to see that hey another quick question which structure is shown in the following image Let's see if you can pause and figure that out i hope you got it right monocots versus dicots so you don't have to explain very many differences between these things but uh, here's a typical monocot plant. Here's a typical dicot plant. So notice how these leaves are very different, especially with how the uh, the vascular bundles are spread out in dicot. So this is, like I said, what a kid would typically draw with a dicot. This, an artist, would draw a little bit more. So it's the number of leaves that are actually contained in the initial embryo. It's either one or it's two, dicotyledon or monocotyledon, many ways to pronounce that. So flowering plants, we're talking about flowering plants here. Another word is angiospermatophytes. Angiospermatophytes? Oh, I'm getting confused between reproduction. Angiospermophytes, sorry, angiospermophytes. If you've just studied ecology and classification, then you should know the various types of uh, plants that are out there. Bryophytes, angiospermophytes, coniferophytes, uh, philocenophytes. I can't believe I just recall that off the top of my head. Anyways, we're talking about flowers here. Angiospermophytes split into two groups. Oil, O-I-L, orchids, irises, lilies. Okay, that's to help you remember. And then most trees, shrubs, and many non-woody plants and other flowers are also uh, are called dicots, basically. So the main difference is you can use the, the word to actually help you there. Mono means one and di means two. So it's one seed leaf versus two seed leaves. The leaf veins are parallel in monocots where they're kind of branched out and net-like in dicots. Um, vascular bundles are randomly spread. If you jump back to somewhere previous in the video, you'll see that the vascular bundles, for example, in the stem are spread out as opposed and, and not as organized as in the dicots. So the vascular bundles are organized in a ring near the outside of the stem. This is something that's interesting. The leaves are actually formed in multiples of three I don't know who figured that out, but they counted them up. That's one way of classification. Whereas in dicots, the organs are in multiples of four or five. Finally, there's a difference between the roots. So the way that you would draw roots in a typical picture that a three-year-old would draw for plant roots once they've just learned about that is um, branched out roots, right? You draw one root and then branching, 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 branching. That's what you do for dicots. For monocots, that's not the same. You have these unbranched roots. So it's like from the end of here, you just have a, a, a fray of, you know, like hair growing out of a mole. Awesome. Here's another diagram to help you sort this out. If you do a quick search for monocots versus dicots, you can find lots of images about this.